Lynn, are we ready? I think so. Well, okay. we'll, we'll see. I'm not sure that's right. Yeah. Oh, no. She's going to put that back there. Oh, for this one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay so, um, I think this, maybe you do. Okay. I've been very excited about what you've done so far, so I can't, Sorry. I feel like I started every session by talking about what I was saying today, but this session is particularly special for me, um, and I'm so excited to be able to, and you already met Jane, and for you to be able to introduce Judy Bright to you. Am I correct that this is the one for projecting out there? This is for the film. Correct. Is that okay? So we need, <coughs> you need both. Need okay. Well, hello everybody. <laughs> um, before we start the the interview, I just wanted to draw your attention to some questions that were also in your binder that you can try and keep in the back of your mind or on the table in front of you as we're talking. Um, not about Judy's experience per se, that you're free to think about and ask anything you'd like of her afterwards and she's free to answer or not. Um, but these are more about the oral history experience itself. So I just wanna go through them very quickly before we start. Um, so it's this one that says the heart of a good interview and says things to keep in mind while you're listening. Do you notice different kinds of questions? Do different kinds of questions elicit different kinds of responses? Were there opportunities for the narrator to reflect? What did you notice about the nonverbal levels of communication? We'll see if I can actually do this. Um, were there any elements in the room that you found distracting? Other questions you might have asked? Um, understanding that every interview is unique and, um, and that it will unfold however it's going to unfold. Um, if we had a longer time, this is going to be a very short interview. We have about 30 minutes to talk, Judy and I. Um, and if it were a full length interview, if there might be some questions that we'd circle around to again or come back to or that we'd ask in a different different time or talk about in a different time or way, but every interviewer and interview subject, uh, narrator, you know, will, will construct the interview however they're going to. So it's a one-time event. It's a snapshot that you're going to see. It's a narrative um, of this moment. Um, and I think it will be interesting for Judy and for Judith also to think about how it feels that's different from the last time the two of you spoke, which was just 10 years ago. It was July 2000, um, I noticed when I was looking at when that interview was. Um, so, can I move this like that? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> 
Hi, Judy. Hi, here we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, Judy and I have had a little conversation um, a couple of days ago just to introduce ourselves to each other and talk about the kinds of things that we were going to talk about today. As Judith mentioned, um, JWA did an oral history with uh, Judy about 10 years, it was 10 years ago, um, as part of the Women Who Dared program um, that was focusing on her activism and we're going to continue that discussion uh, today, uh, talking about your experiences in the early 1960s, actually 1961 as a freedom rider, um, and possibly we'll see where our conversation goes to some of your other activities in the civil rights movement. Um, and it, as I say, it's a little bit because we only have a little bit of time here. So because people in the room don't know uh, you, can, can you describe your family briefly? Um, and where you grew up, your family growing up? My fa I grew up in Newton. Um, I have one brother. Um, I'm the younger of the two. My father was a businessman. My mother was... Can't hear. So just... Oh, can you hear me now? Could you hear me before? <laughs> just pull your chair in a little bit closer and just speak right into the I, I grew up in a family better? in Newton um, with an older brother. Um, father was a businessman. My mother was a homemaker long before the days of women's limb. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. Did you, um, can you talk a little bit about how your family um, expressed their Jewishness when you were a child? When I was a child. And teenager, I mean, in My your growing family, up years. I mean, Newton, as many of you might know, is a, a pretty Jewish community. Um, we went to temple only on the high holidays. Um, my brother was bar mitzvahed. I was not because I was a girl. And in those days, only in the most religious families did Jewish girls get bar mitzvahed. So being Jewish was not a huge part of my life, though I certainly identify that way. Did you belong to a synagogue? Yes, we belonged to Temple Israel in Brookline. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our rabbi was very, very outspoken liberal, who probably influenced me a lot. Rabbi Gittleson? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand you took a course with him um, when you were a teenager. Right. Um, and he had been very involved in the civil rights movement, from yeah, what he, I gather. He actually wrote to me many times when I was in jail. Did he? He did. Yeah, he was great. What do you think you learned um, from him um, as a teenager that might have sort of helped form who you were, this person who became a, a freedom writer later? I can't answer. I don't know. I mean, I think I, he was very liberal. and My family was also very liberal. I, so I can't say I learned it more from him than from anyone else. My grandmother was um, more than liberal. In fact, she was investigated by McCarthy. <laughs> and... Um, my family totally stood behind her the whole time, and I learned a lot from that. What was her activity that she, she was being she was investigated for? She was a for? great supporter of socialist causes, and um, she was um, the Rosenberg, she, she tried, helped find a home for the Rosenberg children. Um, and I'm not sure, I was very young um, every, about everything she did, but the line between communist and socialist was very thin there. I'm not sure where she was. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting watching the McCarthy hearings and, and being so sure that everybody in the room was totally behind her. And that was your family? And that was my family, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when did you first become aware of activism that was going on in the country on behalf of civil rights for blacks? I was mostly um, uh, learned, it came, it hit me really strong when I was in my last year of college and I heard about the sit-ins in the South and people being arrested. Um, and I, I was bowled over by it, thinking about it. Um, and I think it was at that time uh, that I decided that I was probably going to go south and do something. Although at the time, the Freedom Rides hadn't started yet. Or they did start just before I graduated, but I 
I really became aware earlier that year and began thinking about it a tremendous amount. Mm. What, what do you think appealed to you about? Uh, it was, it was the, the justice of, you know, the injustice of the um, se of segregation and, and the fighting for justice that was going on. And it was, to be honest, um, it was that, but it was also longing for adventure. That was really a part of it for me because I was, I've always been aware that a lot of people could have wanted to take part in this, but they, they could have gone to the NAACP and, and, and uh, stuffed envelopes. But I don't know, I, I just had to have adventure. Plus, I believed in it being the right thing to do. Hmm. Do you think that um, the timing of when this occurred in your life, it was your senior year, 1961, mm -hmm. at Smith College, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a transitional moment in your life. You were graduating from college, and you know this was a time when, for many women, uh, they'd gone, they would go to college looking for a husband for you know, right. an MRS yeah. degree. So right. how did, were you aware of uh, those kinds of callings for women and how did you feel about it? How did that play into this, do you think? Well, it's true that when I went to college, people, women didn't have the same kind of careers they have now. And a lot of people were looking for marriage. And it's not that I wasn't, I mean, <laughs> But I, um, I think that it really was hearing about the sit-ins and the, the, the passion of it that really made me think a lot about it. And it, it wasn't that I didn't have anything else to do. Um, I probably would have gone home for the summer and looked for a job and, mm -hmm. um, and whatever would have happened to happen. But that just really called to me and I, I made that decision. It was really difficult for my parents because they were very worried about me. Um, I, I had asthma as I was growing up, and they knew, I think they knew the outcome of this was undeniable that I would go to jail. And I think they were terrified and tried a lot of ways to keep me from going, not because they didn't think it was a good thing to do, but because they were very frightened, and I can understand that. Mm -hmm. But basically, I just did it anyway. Um, Can you describe how you first got involved with the Freedom Riders? I went to New York to the core office, the Congress of Racial Equality, where James Farmer was the, he was the head of that, and talked to the people there. And This was June, right, of 1961? Was, it was either June or early July. I don't even remember the exact date uh -huh. that I went. Um, and. Uh, he, they, the people at the core office kind of got me hooked up with the Freedom Riders. They ended up taking a bus to Atlanta, Georgia, and hooking up with a group of integrated people um, and getting on a bus with them, traveling along the southernmost edge of the country into Jackson, Mississippi, where we knew we would get arrested. And that was actually the point of it. The point was to fill the jails with basically innocent people who were doing the right thing, and then the press would take it up and the whole country would get up in arms, and it would change the way things were done there. At the time, it was even illegal to go into the white waiting room with a, with a black person. Um, and we, that's what we did. We took a bus across the south into Jackson, Mississippi, where we went into the white waiting room as an integrated group, and we were arrested for disturbing the peace. Um, and we weren't the first group to do that, um, and there were others after us too, but everybody was sent to jail. And we had 40 days, 40 days to appeal our case. If you didn't appeal your case within 40 days, you lost your right to appeal at all. So the decision was to stay in jail for 39 days, try to fill the jails, and appeal out at the last minute, which is what we all did. Can you go back a little bit? I just want to try and get yeah. some more sense of what, what it felt like to you as you were 
boarding that bus and with this group of people, who were, who were the people? And can you just describe the scene and, and what it felt like to you, what you were thinking about? I wasn't scared. <laughs> and the reason I wasn't scared was because I was so young. <laughs> and I thought I was invincible. Um, I, I can't imagine looking back on it why I wasn't scared, but I really wasn't. Um, and I don't even remember all the people in my group, although one of them was a man named Wyatt T. Worker, Walker, Wyatt T. Walker, who was um, Martin Luther King's right-hand man. Um, and there was a minister, a white minister from the Boston area, and I, I hardly remember the rest, actually, uh -huh. sorry to say. There were about eight of us. Uh -huh. Were other people scared, do you think? I think people that were, <coughs> who lived in the South, were probably much more scared than I was, because they knew what they were in for. What kind of training had you received before you went? Can you, can you describe that? Not much. That's really? what I would say, not much. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that there were um, nonviolent workshops going on in the South to teach people how to basically go limp if they were attacked or arrested. Um, but I don't think I got much of that. I just got on that bus and went. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing to think about. Um, were you given any kind of training in civil disobedience or other than going limp about what you were supposed to do? Um, no, I just know, I know that I knew that we were going to go into that waiting room and that we were going to get arrested uh -huh. and that we were to be nonviolent. Uh -huh. How did you feel about civil disobedience and nonviolence at that point? I thought civil disobedience was great if it was disobeying something that was so unjust. Uh -huh. I didn't have any question about breaking the law at all. Uh -huh. um, and I and what was the second part about being arrested? Yeah. Uh -huh. I was a little nervous, <laughs> but not much. Uh -huh. I thought it was all going to be okay. I remember, well, I remember walking into jail and thinking, oh, this couldn't be. This is terrible. <laughs> and that John Kennedy was president, and he would get me out. I don't know, it just like he would get us all out, and it would all be fine. But of course, he couldn't do that. Right. Yeah. What was it like when you went into the jail? Well, I went into two different jails. The first one was the city jail, where there were, um, it was all women, and um, they, it was a room maybe the size of this, smaller, somewhat smaller than the size of this, where these tables are squared. And there was a toilet on one side, totally open, and we were all put in there. and. Um, we just hung out and... Who were the all? All they were, Everybody that was in there, actually I should have said that, everybody that was in there was a Freedom Rider. Mm -hmm. We were kept very separate from other prisoners because by that time the spotlight was on Mississippi and, and um, they were afraid of us getting beaten up by other prisoners. Although that had certainly happened in the past where they had put civil rights um, workers in jail with other prisoners so that they would get beaten up. But I think by this time they were really afraid of that, so um, they kept us separate. And were you a mixed racial group? Were the black women and the they, white we women were together in the cell? In that cell, yes. But mm -hmm. then later, when, later, when oh, later we um, were moved to the um, Parchment State Penitentiary Maximum Security Unit. Mm -hmm. And that happened after a few days. And that was like, um, that was a long line of cells facing the corridor. And there were one or two people in each cell. And the black women were kept separate from the white women. We're all in the same cell, wrote, well, cell block, I guess you call it. But there were never a black and a white woman in the same cell. And the men were in a different part of the prison. How did the black women and the white women relate to each other um, in this 
in the prison? We could talk to each other because all the cells were open on one side. Um, we had a lot of nice things happening. We had a, a daily radio program that we made up with every cell had to contribute something. And people sang. We, we sang a lot together, all those freedom songs you've heard. I, I haven't seen the program you saw the other night, but I suspect there was a lot of music in it. Was there? The, uh, the, the, the film we saw yeah, last night? Yeah. There's some. Yeah. Not as well, much there, as there, I... Music was a big part of the civil rights movement, and then we all sang a lot together. And then some women sang by themselves when we had our radio program, and we told jokes. And so that part of it was fun. Part of it was not at all fun. Um, the, the guards were the first time... They, being there was the first time in my life I ever encountered real sadism. And um, if, we, if we sang too much, they would turn on the air conditioning, take away our mattresses, and let us freeze. You know, they'd turn it on really high. Um, that was the biggest punishment. Take away pillows and mattresses and turn on the air conditioning. Um, but also there were definite instances of sadism, like the woman in the cell next to me had a miscarriage while she was in her cell, while the guards stood outside and laughed. It was pretty pathetic, really. How did the women in the cells respond? We could only like say things verbally to her, mm -hmm. um, but there was no way we could help. We were locked in. Right, right. Um, on the second day you were in prison, you, you sit, have said that you managed to start keeping a, a diary <laughs> about your experiences. Um, and I, I was wondering what, what motivated you to start trying to write about your experiences under such difficult and, and dangerous, frankly dangerous circumstances? I guess I must have been mo motivated by knowing that it was an important time and thinking it would be a good thing to have a diary, um, just for my own memories, um, if nothing else. Um, I, you never really know at the time how important something you're doing is. I mean, sometimes you know, but I mean, you don't really know um, what the outcome is going to be. As it turned out, it was a big outcome because the the, the, um, the laws asking for integration of public transportation were enforced within very few months after all this happened. It became totally illegal to segregate on, in, in public transportation. Okay. But at the time, the diary, I don't know exactly, I don't remember why I decided to do it. I just did it. Do you remember what you what you wrote about, what you thought was important to write down? I wrote down where I was, who I was talking to, about songs we were singing, about how the guards were behaving, how, um, how what was happening to me in particular. Um, but I think that's about it. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I lost, the diary was lost, <coughs> so I don't have it anymore. Can you tell that story? Yeah, the story is that my mother, I, I, I hid the diary in the hem of my skirt. I kept stuffing pieces of paper into my hem. And, and when I was released from jail, I went home. And my, my parents, of course, had been really worried about me. And I was anemic at that time when I left jail. And my mother was feeding me steak every day and trying, <laughs> trying to take really good care of me. And one of the things she did was the laundry. Before I had realized to tell her that I had this diary in my skirt hem. So it got pretty washed away. Hmm. So I don't have it anymore, unfortunately. Although maybe, I don't know, I, I did try to, a few years ago, I, I had kept it anyway. It was all like, runny and I tried to resurrect part of it and, and um, it did not, I don't think I wrote in a very interesting way. <laughs> it wasn't as interesting as I hoped it would be, but I only could resurrect bits and pieces of it. 
Um, can you tell, just tell so that everybody knows where, what, what happened, how you actually got out of jail at that point, um, at the end of this period of 39 days? Um, I actually left a little before the 39 days. Um, when I was in jail, well, I think I mentioned that I had asthma and I had medication and the guards took it away from me and said I was a drug addict and because I needed this little kind of atomizer thing. And so my asthma got pretty bad and I asked if I could see the doctor. The doc and they said, oh, the doctor's on vacation this month. But the fact was there was a whole prison hospital. And in fact, after a week or two, the doctor came to see me and said, this isn't drugs, this is medication, she can have it. So they gave it back to me, and the minute the doctor left, they took it away again. So in fact, I was really suffering from not being able to, re to breathe well, and um, I had written a letter to my parents. I had written more than one letter, and be careful what I said, but in one of them I, I said they had taken this medication away. So my parents actually, flew to Mississippi. It was maybe three or four days before I was going to be released. Mm -hmm. And they got me out just that little bit early. So that's how I ended up leaving. And I actually was a little embarrassed that I hadn't stayed the whole time. But that's yeah. how it happened that I got out. Yeah. Um, and you continued your activism. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about <coughs> that for a few minutes? Yep, sure. I am um, in a second, please. Sure. <clears throat> when I got back to Boston, I started working for the NAACP, and then came the time that the March on Washington, the famous, where Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech was coming up, and the NAACP um, was organizing buses to go to Washington, so I worked on that for a while. Um, and then I went to Washington and actually stood probably not further away from him than those doors are from me that now when he gave that speech, um, which was a huge privilege. Um, and then after that, um, I was active in, um, I did draft counseling during the Vietnam War, trying to keep, get to help people who didn't want to go. Um, and I was somewhat active in the women's movement. It was just like one thing after another. Uh -huh. After I had children, I, I never wanted to be arrested again. <laughs> um, that was a fearful thing for me uh -huh. um, because of my first experience, although it did happen one more time. Um, my husband, oh, the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I got married um, uh, in 1964. And my husband and I went back and lived in um, Meridian, Mississippi for a year, um, helping um, register voters, teaching at a freedom school, and doing other things. Um, there was, we were or organizing the community, but with the people that lived in Meridian, the, the um, black people there. We lived with a white family, oh, no, excuse me, we lived right. with a black family mm -hmm. um, while we were there. And um, it was pretty scary at times. We went right after those three boys were murdered. Um, we went to take their place. Um, and of course, it was probably the safest place to go then because after those murders, they were really on pretty good behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so I was arrested one more time while I was there for, um, for receiving stolen property, um, which was a, a made up thing. Um, and that was very, very scary because I was by my, oh no, yes, I was by myself then because all the men went to, the, all the men and the black women went to one jail where there was no room for white women, so I went to the city jail by myself. I was the only white woman right then. Yeah. And that was pretty scary. Yeah. I didn't know what was gonna to happen to me that night. 
And what yeah. did? Nothing. Uh, I mean, people came to my cell door all night and yelled obscenities at me, and, and I, I didn't really know how long I was going to be in jail or what would happen, but um, as it turned out, they had traveling lawyers in those days that would travel around the South and kind of troubleshoot, and there was one lawyer that came by the next morning. So um, totally, I mean, if I had only known that, I wouldn't have been so frightened. Yeah. So I did get out of jail the next morning that mm -hmm. time. So I just want to talk for a minute about um, the fact that in going south, you were crossing a number of boundaries. You were crossing racial boundaries and cultural boundaries, boundaries, et cetera, religious boundaries. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you uh, felt about um, Southern culture, what, what it was like for you to try to fit in um, at the time. Well, I didn't try to fit in. I mean, I didn't realize when I first went there that they would know who I was immediately, not me personally, but they would know I was a civil rights worker because my hair wasn't combed a certain way and I wasn't dressed a certain way. And I think I could just walk down the street there and people would know that I was not a Southern woman. Um, but I did go to visit, so, um, we had a friend who had family in Meridian and she had told them that my husband and I were there and we went to visit. They invited us, very brave, a white family. That's what I wanted to um, clarify. Very mm -hmm. bravely invited us to come to dinner at their house. So what we had to do to go to their house was to take a taxi out of town to a parking lot somewhere, let the taxi go, and they picked us up and brought us to their house. And we had dinner there and then they said so, uh, some roundabout way for us to get back so that they wouldn't get connected with us because it would have been very, very dangerous for us, more, for, the, for them rather, more dangerous than you can imagine um, for them to be associated with socializing or helping civil rights workers in that day. Um, the husband in that family owned a factory um, and he, I think that's why they didn't leave the South, because they had two little girls that they could not talk to about how they felt, which was uh, that they were all for the Civil Rights Movement, but they could not talk to their children about it because they were so afraid their children would go to school and say something and get beaten up. So they were very silent within their family. A really sad and hard way to live um, experience with friendly white people while I was in Mississippi that whole year. Were they able to talk to you um, and your husband that evening yes. more openly? Yeah, after their children went to bed, they talked to us, hmm. you know, and, and that's how I find that, found out that they never talked to their children about how they felt. Mm -hmm. How about your relations with the black family with whom you lived and the other black uh, people with whom you were working? That was fine. They were, they were very hospitable to us. I mean, they didn't have a lot of money and neither did we and they supported us, you know, with food and lodging while we were there. Um, it was a young couple with a baby, an adorable baby. And then there were a lot of, I mean, the heart of the movement was really the Southern black women and the churches. And they were all very happy that we were there because well, I shouldn't say that totally true. Um, it was white people getting uh, arrested that got attention because black people were always arrested. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it was really great for them that all these white people were coming south and, and being arrested. On the other hand, there's a lot of people that felt that, that we were outsiders and that the black people should have done it themselves. And how did you feel about that? Um, awkward, really. Hmm. At the time? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, th the people that we were with mostly were totally accepting and supporting. Um, but th then there were, you know, the Stokely Carmichaels. And, um, you know, I'm not so sure he was so happy about it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we just have time for 
a couple more minutes of conversation. Um, and I, I wanted to address something you said in your Women Who Dared interview um, 10 years ago, where you, you mentioned that um, you thought that women's, ex you thought and found that women's experiences of, of gender disparity during the civil rights movement may have had a causative impact on the evolution of the women's movement later. Yes. And I was wondering if you could just talk for a minute about your own experiences as a woman in the movement and how you felt at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think, it, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> I, I didn't really have any personal experiences with, with it, but I think in the greater, in the organization, people that weren't necessarily in jail, but in the whole organization of what was going on there, I think women had more desk jobs and men were out doing it. That's, I mean, that's my understanding of how the civil rights movement radicalized people and then made them turn to the gender issues. But in terms of my own experiences, no. I wish I could say more about that, but I can't. <laughs> um, do you think your experiences or your awareness of other women's experiences affected your, your growing consciousness of women's issues generally? Yes, I do. I, I think, well, first, you know, if you end up um, joining a civil disobedience movement or something else, you, you become more aware, uh, radicalized is one word you could use. Um, but become more sensitized to injustice and also feel more of your own power as an individual. Because even if there are a thousand people doing something, every individual makes up that thousand. And you become more aware of your own power to try to change things. So in that sense, it kind of influenced me to become active in the women's movement. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, particularly given the <coughs> setting before we close, um, whether you make any connections between your activism and your Jewish identity. Um, I don't think so. I do think that it's true that Jewish people tend to be more on the liberal side, and I think that influenced me. Um, but in terms of um, actually feeling that it was my Jewishness, I don't think it affected me a lot. Mm -hmm. Are there lessons that you think you learned in this very formative period in your life that you've carried into your other aspects of your life as you've continued and, and grown? Um, well, one of which I just spoke about, that you have a lot of power, or some power, as an individual. Um, and um, I did continue to want to be um, active for a long time, but then I got involved in my family and my little children, and um, when they grew up, I... This isn't really what I learned, though. So that's just something... I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. I learned what I just said, but I don't know if I learned a lot more. Probably I'll think of a great answer to this on my way home. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close? Um, well, I, I, I'd like to say why I came today. Um, because for many years I, I didn't talk about this. And the reason I didn't talk about it is because um, it was, I felt people would always say, oh, you were so brave, or, you know, oh, how wonderful that you did that. And, and, it, would, and it would embarrass me. Um, and I, I felt like if I talked about it at all, I would um, just be asking people to say those things to me and it made me very comfortable knowing as I did that I had loved adventure at the time and all that. Um, but talking to from an aunt of mine recently. <laughs>
said um, that I was being really unfair and selfish and that um, too long from now there won't be many of us left. I really had an obligation to do this. So I just come. Well, very grateful. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, for this conversation, for all the ways in which you've told the story and shared it with all of us. Um, I certainly know that it's been very inspiring to me. Um, and I think I can speak for all of us here that we're very glad that you made the decision yeah. to come. Um, I'm and glad my aunt scolded me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So I think we're going to stop there um, for now because we've really, uh, we're running right up against the time limits that we have. Um, and we have a few minutes that we can um, take some questions. So there are two kinds of things that we can do. And I'm just going to open it up and let you speak um, as you will. One is to address any of the oral history kind of issues um, that came up. And the other is if you have any more um, particular questions for Judy. Um, we discussed this beforehand. This is a shared authority, as I said. And uh, she said that she would be willing to um, respond to any questions that you might have for her. So I'm going to open this up now and, and let people speak. Yeah. Um, what have you told your children about their involvement uh, or what ideas have you passed on to them? Well, they certainly know this story. Um, and uh, I, I think they've they both are very, um, very, deter very um, wedded to justice in the world. Um, not just because of this, but just our our family feels that way strongly, and they do too. Um, I probably, for many years, didn't tell them as much as I should have, but I started doing that now. But they certainly know the general story. I'm curious whether they asked. Did they start as they got older they to started, ask you? Yes, they started to ask more when they got older. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. Why don't we wait till we get the mic? Thank you so much. This very. It's this one. <laughs> we sort of need both the people to hear is the problem. Okay, there we go. So first of all, thank you so much. This is a very memorable time for me and um, I appreciate the fact that you came here and that you were encouraged to do so by your aunt, was it? Um, my question is, were you uh, at the time of, the, um, of your graduation from Smith, and were you aware of anything that um, had been going on in, in the Holocaust? And did, were you aware that that, and did that have any influence on your actions or activities? I certainly was aware of the Holocaust, no doubt about it. Um, my parents, um, I think, I've lost my train of thought, that's what I think. Um, um, I don't think the Holocaust particularly itself, like I was thinking about it when I decided to do this, but I think the Holocaust had an effect on my family that in, in how they taught us about what's right. In, in justice and all that. So in that sense, it would have had an influence on me, but it wasn't the direct thing. The direct thing was what was actually happening in the South. Thank you. So you mentioned <laughs> that you didn't realize at the time quite how important it was. When did you realize that it was a big thing, and what made you realize that? I think I realized it as the civil rights 
went on and on, and things, things changed what seems both very slowly and very radically. I mean, if I think back to my childhood, I mean, things were so drastically different. I mean, there were still black and white drinking fountains in the South, and um, as things moved along, it became that the sit-ins, to me, were the beginning of a huge, um, movement that would made a, a wonderful change in this country and that the freedom rides followed this, the sit-ins. So that's when I began to realize it was afterwards. Someone back there. Be, um, behind you. Gwen. Yeah. Did your children when they were growing up do anything of the nature that you did? And if so, can, does it, like your parents, can you go back to your parents and think, did you react in a different way because of your experience? Or were they just very calm, tame kids? They were <laughs> regular kids. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do anything like that, but they certainly would have approved of anyone who did anything like that. But they, they themselves have not been political activists at all. Do you think that... I'm sorry, that your like parenting philosophy or how you raised your kids was like how was it impacted by your your experiences? That, that you can't maybe can I don't really know how to answer that. I think I'm I am myself as myself as a mother. Um, I was myself as I went south. Um, I I I can't think how that experience really changed anything I would have done with my kids. There's somebody behind Gwen, but yes. I just wondered if you do anything now to feed the desire for that kind of adventure. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. Not right now, I'm an artist. I live in Gloucester, um, and I'm not really doing anything um, like that at all. I did, um, for a long time, I worked for the AIDS Action Committee in Boston um, during the height of the um, AIDS um, plague. Um, and I doing that, but now I'm kind of like just pulling more inward, I think. You spoke about your parents' reaction, and we've heard about the reaction from other parents. What about your friends um, that you had? What was their reaction to what you were doing? and? impact their choices in any way that you know of? Oh boy. Boy, I wish I had a really good answer to that question. Um, I really did this by myself. I don't think even, you know, I came home from college, I stayed with my parents for a couple weeks and left. And I don't think that my friends mostly knew that I was doing it until they read it in the paper. So I can't say they influenced me or I, um, but they were all like really um, supportive when I got back. But I think they were probably as surprised as anyone. <laughs> Surprise answer, huh? <laughs> what aspects of how you've lived your life make you proud? Well, I'm, I'm proud that I did this, for one thing. Um, although, as I said, at the time, I didn't really realize. Um, I'm proud of the way I brought up my kids. I'm proud of taking part in the movement and in the Vietnam movement. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, there are things I'm proud of too. <laughs> but um, I'm okay with hearing them. <laughs> I might not tell you about them. <laughs> but um, I guess that's it. I mean, I'm proud that I, I, I've done things all, through a lot of my life that that I took a stand on what I believed was right. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. I'm sorry. Just a real quick question. You said that your rabbi wrote to you when you were in jail. Yeah. And I'm curious as to what did he say and how did that impact you? I, th I don't remember what he said except that he was so supportive. He really was proud that, that, that I was doing this and he let me know that. And uh, do you ask something else besides what he said? I said, how did it, how did it impact oh, you? Oh, it just gave me a lot. I, I was so um, comforted because it was so hard being in jail. It really was. I, I didn't know how people did it for years. Um, and and it, was, it was wonderful to hear from him and that he really believed in what I was doing and he was proud of me. Sorry. <laughs> I have two questions for you, actually. Um, the first is whether you, after being in uh, Mississippi for a year, whether you ever went back to spend time there, and if so, what it was like, if it seemed changed. I never went back, actually. Um, it was really hard there for my health. Um, the, the, the air there was, I don't know what it was, but my asthma was terrible there. In the year that we were living there, and I, um, I, I didn't go back. My second question um, has to do with the articles that were uh, written about your time as yeah. a freedom fighter and in jail yeah. in the Boston Globe, which, as you know, are part of our curriculum. Yeah. We use them in the Freedom Riders lesson plan. Um, and I know that when I told you that, you kind of groaned and said, ugh, I hated those articles. So That's true. I wondered if you would just say a few words to us about the experience of having written what you didn't like about them, because many of these teachers may um, teach using them. So I think that would be helpful for them to have a okay. sense of your perspective on the letters. I actually should have read them before I came today, but I didn't. Um, at the time, I felt uh, the Lois, I forget her last name, um, came to interview me. She interviewed me for two full days um, when I got back from the first time that I went to Mississippi. And I, I must have told her everything that crossed my mind, everything. And I felt that the articles were too um, human interesty and not political enough. And I, I was very embarrassed by them. Um, it's, I think she even talked about what I wore. Um, she definitely talked about what I just told you about my mother by mistake, washing out the diary, it was a little headline in the paper, and I was horrified at that and mortified for my mother who was so embarrassed. I mean, I think I must have told her that, never dreaming that she'd make a headline out of it in the Globe. Um, so, <clears throat> I had a bad feeling about those articles. If I read them again, after all these years, I might see that there were some good things in them. But at the time, I felt terrible about them. Um, thanks so much for your stories. I'm wondering how, um, Talking about this now versus talking about it ten years, um, have your reflections on on the story changed at all? Um, I don't think so. I think um, if you would ask me, have they changed now from when I was first interviewed when I first got back? I would say yes, but from ten years ago, I don't think so, really. 
when I first got back, it, it was really different. I didn't know what the outcome of everything would be. I didn't know that, you know, this would be a big deal, 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides and how they really helped things change. Um, but 10 years ago, I knew. Swim, and then Gail. As you were participating in the Freedom Rides, by what were you most surprised? Um, I think two things are coming to my mind. Um, one is that the open arms of everybody, all the people in the movement in the South, to our coming down. Um, and the this, this singing and the, the love that went on between people. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side is I was really shocked by um, the sadism in the prison. Really shocked. Because I, I actually had a cellmate for a while who, who was an orphan. She, she was grown, but she had, her parents had died young, and she grew up in an orphanage, and she said she was used to it. But I was lucky. I had really loving parents, and um, I just had no experience of anything like that before. Your experiences as a freedom woman. It was an actually pretty funny story. Is, um, when I was back and living in Newton, and I was organizing women's groups. Um, I had an ad in the paper, if you'd like to be part of a women's group, this was during the women's movement, um, please call Judy Wright with my phone number. And then I got a call from this woman who I was in the South with, who had also moved to Newton unbeknownst to me. So we got back together and we had a good friendship for a long time. But other than that, no. But I was interested, there's a, um, a book that's come out called Breach of Peace. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. And um, I came across that book and, and saw pictures of people I knew well, and that was really f interesting for me. I'm wondering about the art that you make. Can you tell us more about what your art is like? It's nothing to do with anything like this. It's not at all political. I, I um, I'm really more um, interested in, in beauty as part of art, although I'm, I mean, I like to see other people's work that has political connotations, but it's not what I do. Well, I, I'm just wondering what, oh. you, what kind of art you do. <laughs> oh, uh, I, do, I do a lot of still life, and I do a lot of street scenes from my town. Um, and I also do, um, I, I make jewelry. Are you wearing, is the necklace you're wearing, you made that? Yeah, that's one. I, and I use a lot of African beads in my jewelry. It's really interesting. I mix it with a lot of other stuff. And I make mosaics. I'm kind of a jack of all trades and master of none. <laughs> Hi. Um, you said that you hadn't been back to Mississippi since 64 because of, for health reasons. Um, I guess the question I had was uh, a number of GIs who went over um, in, during World War II, based on their experiences in Europe, were so, uh, Jewish GIs, were so upset by when they went to Germany and what they yeah. saw um, in terms of the atrocities and the, the behavior of uh, the Germans. And I was wondering if, in a somewhat similar note, in terms of the sadism, in terms of the behavior that, um, you know, uh, a number of freedom writers experienced, and civil rights activists experienced in Mississippi or in Alabama, um, if that had, to your knowledge, either personally or through people you've known, um, had sort of a feeling of, I just don't want to go back to that part of the country or if there's been a sort of a healing period or not. I think I could go back now. I don't think I would be so frightened. But 
Well, I was there. It was frightening to be driving down the road. I mean, you never knew what could happen. And um, I think that for a, a long time afterwards, I mean, I, when I came back here, I was frightened if I saw a policeman. <laughs> you know, I just, um, so I probably, you're right, for a while I was, probably wouldn't have wanted to go back. But I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be afraid now. But you never knew, I mean, we were arrested or uh, stopped all the time. You, you could not drive a car in Meridian, Mississippi and, and look like we looked or have a black person in your car and not get stopped and get some false charges against you. It happened all the time. My husband was driving um, the, the, the family that we lived with. The child was ill and, and he was driving the mother and child to a hospital and he got stopped for going through a stop sign which he hadn't done and they wanted to take him to the police station. I mean, just, and he said, I'll come myself, but I have to bring these people to the hospital first. And they wouldn't let him. They took all three of them to the police station. It was just, it was like a vendetta against anybody that was helping with the civil rights movement. So it was nerve wracking. Thank you. you were talking about the story of your journal and being embarrassed about yeah. it appearing in the paper. But for us at JWA, actually, that's been an interesting story for us to think about just how, um, how easy it is for stories to get lost right. and how some stories are more vulnerable to being lost, the stories that are written in secret and that are shoved into the hands of skirts being among those yeah. kinds of stories. But that um, yeah. there are, are so many stories like yours that are, are really important for us to know and that um, for whatever reasons and I, not to, I certainly would not lay the blame on your mom, uh, but just yeah. that, that how much we have to um, be grateful for the stories that we can hold on to and how much we have to try to reclaim the ones that, that do get lost and how, how much we value those stories that are, you know, could, could so easily slip through our fingers. So we're very grateful that um, despite the loss of your journal that we can have parts of your story. Yeah. Well, thank you all for asking me to come. You're such a great audience. <laughs> Questions. I felt bad that I was um, not giving the kind of information people expected. You know, like I don't know what effect this had on my life, and, and like, you know, like, like what effect did it have on your life? And you know, and I'd say I don't know. <laughs> but that's just the truth. And that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. Fine. I think yeah. I still got you know a really rich. Yeah. rich just hearing from you is yeah. so important to them. And that's partly what I think your 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 aunt was it? Yeah. You, you yeah. Know, or, yeah.